Hey everyone, I'm Jay Shear and welcome to another episode of Business Minds Coffee Chat. The goal of this show is to share insights, help to lift and inspire others, and deliver relevant, meaningful, and actionable content. Our guest today is an internationally recognized expert on business strategy, customer service, sales, and marketing. He's the author of three books, a dynamic speaker, consultant and trainer with over 30 years experience helping some of the best known brick and mortar retailers beat online competitors and get back to excellent health with amazing customer service. He and his work have appeared on ABC, Fox, MSNBC, and PBS, and featured in articles in Entrepreneur, The New York Times, and The Wall Street Journal. Please welcome the retail doctor himself, Bob Fibbs. Thanks, Jay. Glad to be here. Excellent. Well, thank you for joining us today. So let, let's start where your journey began and also where did your passion for the retail industry come from? My passion for the retail industry came from me making money from the retail industry. That's where my passion came from. I put myself through college selling shoes, and then I took a little regional Western wear company from about five stores to 55, became the biggest in the United States. And one day the owner asked a question, and it was, what's the company's greatest uh, asset? And I said, it's employees. And he said, wrong. And various people tried to answer it. And uh, finally, the owner said, oh, it's customers. And I went down to his office, and I said, customers can go anywhere. They're they're fickle. They'll go by a different price or different things. But we built this company over the last 14 years based on people. And I can't work for a company that doesn't believe that anymore. I'm out in two weeks and I left. And um, I actually, on the very last day, because it was a Western store, uh, Kathy Mateo had a big hit then called Walking Away a Winner. So I called up the local country station in, uh, in California, in Los Angeles, where most of the stores were. There were like 30 some stores around Los Angeles. And I said, at 5 p.m., I need you to play this song. And so it got to five o'clock and, you know, I've given the keys and I'm out, I'm walking out the door and they damn it, they didn't do it. And the dedication comes on and I'm walking out and the whole idea is I'm walking away a winner. And I've always had that feeling like that's it. And then I took a couple of uh, months to lick my wounds and feel sorry for myself. And then I went to a Tony Robbins seminar where he said, uh, you better come up with a brand nobody else can do better than you. And I literally left the Universal Amphitheater and, uh, thought about it on the way home and filed the trademark for the retail doctor the next morning. And the rest, as they say, is history. But uh, I was a consultant and um, really until I found this one guy who was going up against the Starbucks that was about to open uh, two, well, they've opened one Starbucks 10 blocks away from this guy. He'd been in business for 25 years and they're about to open another one 100 feet from his front door. And I basically remade his business, went up 50% the first year, 40% the next, got some local press, and then I called uh, some more local press, and then I just called the New York Times, and I said, would you be interested in a story about how the little guy beat the big guy? And they're like, sure. So I did an interview in July, and I'm speaking in Manhattan in, uh, I think it was October 29th, and uh, I opened the Sunday paper, and my picture's on the front, and I open up the business section, the whole top of it, is uh, meet the category killer killer and that was the story about me which i wrote my first book led to more uh, speeches and then the la times doing business makeover so when people tell me oh um you know how long you've been doing this it's like i'm in my 30 some year and a lot of people still don't know who we are who i am and it never ends and you know i i was lucky in some ways jay that people gave a damn that they supported the local independent at that time and i was able to hit it out of the park so for any of your entrepreneurs that are listening to you you got to hit it out of the park you can't just do a job you have to hit it out of the park and then from that people will pay to have you tell them what to do great story well let, let's go back to that coffee shop for just a moment with the type of growth that you saw and the accolades that you received as a result of it, what were some of the tactical things that you had applied at that time that led to that type of a growth in that industry, competing against the Starbucks? 
Well, it's interesting because Mike is one of the founding members of the Specialty Coffee Association, which is basically the association that said there's got to be so many parts per million of caffeine and all these other chemicals that make up specialty coffee. And, uh, and he knows everything about it. I mean, growers come up to him to find out how to roast their coffee. He's such an uh, icon. But most of his crew didn't know that. And so I just spent uh, two or three days sitting in the coffee house watching what happened. And one of the things I noticed right off the bat was uh, somebody would order a, a latte or something. And uh, the guy would bring up you know, a latte for three bucks back then. And then they put a bagel in the in the uh, in the bag for him and hand it to him. And then the customer put a five dollar bill in the tip jar. And I was like, "Wow!" So uh, when I finally got the contract from Mike, I said um, I had a meeting, and I got all twenty employees into a room. I had a big picture of the Titanic behind me, and I said, "Ladies and gentlemen, we're on the ship, and is, and uh, it's not going down on my watch." Too. Young woman stood up and said, you can't treat us the, that, this way and started crying. And uh, Mike said, well, you know, I actually owe more than I'm selling a year and something is drastically wrong here. And I've made this decision. Well, by the end of that meeting, I had two other people, two other guys who stood up and you can't treat us this way. And within 30 days, I only had one employee left. But I told Mike, this one employee we could build a business with. And I took over essentially his entire business. So I hired who I wanted. I trained them religiously. There was a hundred point test they had to pass. So their knowledge matches, matched Mike's. My whole sales process that I teach now and have been for 30 years, I put in place. And, lo and, and then I came up with a marketing slogan, which was we were down the street from ordinary. And then we just redefined Starbucks as ordinary coffee and had a lot of fun with it. I'd say like, uh, uh, remember when Susan Lucci was a daytime soap opera star yeah. and she had been on for like seven years and never got a, never got a, uh, whatever it is, daytime Emmy. And so one of the ads was, uh, sorry, Susan, maybe the reason why you haven't gotten uh, uh, a daytime Emmy is you're drinking ordinary coffee, switched ours. And then the next year she ended up getting it, which was funny. So we had that. And, you know, the whole thing was to have fun with it, right? Cause if you don't have fun with the marketing, it, you know, and you're trying to go through features and benefits. This is why we're better and we're smaller and all that. Or we're $2 less than the other guy. It's like, no, 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 no. You have to come up with a market that sounds interesting. Little guy beats the big guy. So uh, Cal State Long Beach, actually, they're one of their graduate marketing programs came down the end of the first year. And they wanted to do a survey to find out how our marketing worked. And I said, sure, I'm into it. So they do the survey, something outrageous like 89 percent of a thousand people they pulled in that area knew our tagline knew where we were and had been there within the last six months which was great wow. so the first question they asked me jay is so um are you giving out coupons to get this kind of adoption and i said is that the kind of crap they're teaching you up there mm. well, what do you mean i said no it had nothing to do with it we stopped coupons we stopped promotions we had to end up putting a personality and doing the hard job of saying who's, who is our customer, who isn't our customer, and then finding a way to talk to them. And, you know, even with COVID right now, Jay, um, a lot of brands are saying, look, we're making masks. And you know what? That's kind of like, oh, well, that's a check mark. How does that influence me as a customer, though? So show me that you're going out and doing things and tell me how much you're looking forward to me coming back to your stores but it's not about you. It's about them. That's the important thing to always remember. It's always about the customer. Mm. You know that. Oh, so, so true. Well, you know, you, you, you hit on something that is a great segue because it was something that I wanted to ask you about. And it's who is your ideal client, right? So who are you, who is your target market and who is your client? So for you being in the, the business that you are coaching, consulting, helping brick and mortar retailers, who, who is the ideal client for you? So I have uh, probably three types of, I, well, not probably, I have three customers. One is a major brand or retailer that has either um, their own stores or they have a, ne a, a dealer network that uh, they talk to on a regular basis. So that's from my motivational speaking side. That certainly is 
uh, up until March was uh, a huge part of my living, getting on planes and going all over the world and telling people what to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, I need to say that's uh, now non-existent for the foreseeable futures, but I know it will come back. Sure. And uh, then like medium-sized chains and uh, smaller ones where I do consulting and do business makeovers, I still do a little of that to stay honest so that I know that I'm always uh, able to, to hit it and, and that's important. And then uh, I pretty much have anyone up to four or 500 uh, employees who are taking my online retail sales training program called SalesRx. Like right now, I think I'm training 10,000 people around the world virtually who have never met me or heard me at a speech or anything. Hmm. And I learned that a long time ago. Well, uh, you know, about 10 years ago, I would I do sales training in person. And you've been to a speech of mine. They're really indactive. And, and I do all these different things. But after I do a day with somebody, then they would say like, well, so what do I do now? And I'd say, oh, well, buy my book. That's all I had, Retail Doc's Guide to Growing Your Business. And I realized that I can... I can expose people to my way of doing business and my concepts of sales, but really it's almost like they got to see a diet book. Oh, that makes sense. I understand it. But the how to like, isn't just buying the book. You have to actually put down the bagel, the croissant, you actually have to move around more. You have to do these different things. So I tried for many years to come up with an online retail sales training program. And back then when I started looking at these 10 years ago, it was like a pixelated head that would talk to you and they were just creepy and and took me two years to find the platform I wanted and it's all interactive which means I will ask you a question and I'll say does that make you feel more or less comfortable mm. and then I will just wait and so like my head might do this I might look at my watch I might come down but the training is dead until you click an answer and then whatever you choose you're gonna go down a little different learning path to get there and uh, ultimately, it certifies people. And 84% of our clients report a double-digit increase within six months. So if you're serious, that's a great venue for it. But who isn't my customer is somebody who tells me, oh, yeah, can we get this training done in like a few weeks? It's like, no, it's going to take you at least three months and probably more. And most people stay on us a year. Well, you know, I just need something now. It's like <laughs> it, it, it doesn't work that way. That would be like, you know, um, Hey, Jay, we're at Wimbledon. I could be uh, Selena over there. It's like, dude, you seriously couldn't. You understand the game, but you haven't done this 500,000 times to get it into your body. So you don't know. You have to think about too much. And so, the, you know, I'll have those conversations with people like, I am not a fit for you. You know, go spend your money, uh, but it's not going to work whatever you do because you think it's a quick fix. It's just no different than, you know, with COVID right now. An awful lot of retailers are letting their employees who are untrained sell entry-level goods because they're selling from their own wallet. And the problem with that is you could have had the whole feast. You could have probably gotten the mid and the upper tier because people have less places to buy things. But no, because you didn't teach them, they're just servicing demand. It's like, oh, this is all you need. And they're starting at the bottom. (laughs) So the problem with untrained salespeople is you never know how much you left on the table. Until I come in there, or you take sales or X, and you're like, holy crap, I should have done this three years ago. You're like, I know. There you go. But that, that's exactly what you want to hear. So timing is everything. You know, we, 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 we meet people at the right time for a very specific reason. And you know, you know, that, you know that, that message that uh, when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. And many times that probably is what happens in your case. So I'm, I'm, I'm curious, when you are first engaging with a client, what is the process in working with you? How, you know, what, what, are the, what are the steps involved? Are you getting to know the business first? You're getting to know the people? Kind of, kind of walk us through very briefly what that process looks well, like. Well, I'm a little full of myself, so uh, I would be the first to tell you, Jay, that um, there's not much you could tell me about your business that I wouldn't already know when you called me. So it'd be like, let me guess, traffic is down. Let me guess, you are become too promotional your margins are under pressure, you have high turnover, you have a competitor, you're uh, having trouble with online, is cleaning your clock, and uh, you're a bit panicked about it. (laughs) Yep, that pretty much sums it up. I know, because it's really no mystery as far as as that goes. As far as a speech goes, you know, uh, I do customize my speeches based on the audience, but make no mistake, um, me doing a speech is very much like, 
Oh, it was uh, Barbara Streisand when she went on tour for the first time. That was, what, 20 years ago. And people said she was amazing because she hated doing live concerts. And it was so professional and so excellent. And, and then as she started on the tour, like several weeks down, people were like, this is the exact same show I saw, you know, three weeks ago in Brooklyn. I saw here. And people thought that was bad. And I'm like, I think that's great. Because she realized, like, this is where the laugh is. This is where I get quiet. And she delivered on the experience. So that's what I do with mine is, yes, I will customize a, a speech somewhat. But make no mistake, you want a professional speaker because they know where the laugh is. They know where they're going to take the audience. And they aren't winging it. They aren't sitting up there like a teacher with a blackboard. And here's let me just throw more stuff at you. And, and so I think that's really what what makes the difference. And so consulting and speaking are a little different in that respect. Usually I, with a speech, I say, how do you want them to feel when they walk out the door? Oddly, no one says worse and anxious. <laughs> so uh, I'm in a good place since I'm like the only guy talking hope in retail. So yeah, we're going to talk about that here in just a moment. I, I will say that I had the absolute pleasure of being part of a presentation that you get, gave and a speech that you gave to a, a large industry group. And it was you're very engaging. You're also very straightforward. You're to the point. It's like blunt, no, you might say. What's that? You might call it blunt. Uh, and yeah, blunt. Blunt would be a good word to use. But I tell you, I love it because you stop people in their tracks. Because I think you're delivering a message that people aren't always expecting, or delivering it in a way that people aren't expecting. So you keep them on your toes and different exercises and things to really get you to think through your own business and how do I apply the teachings and those things that I'm learning, how do I take those back and actually put those into practice versus just you spilling out a, a bunch of great ideas and me never doing, any, doing anything with them. Yeah, that's the danger I think so many speech, speakers do. They like, you know, I'm, thank God most people don't remember me when I first started out because I'm sure my first two years was all about, look how bitching I am. Aren't I great? Look at me. And it sometimes calls me up. I have to remember like, oh, yeah, I have to tell stories about how I succeeded. But I hate those uh, speeches where the guy is just always going on about I, I, I. If you're ever doing a speech, the goal is to have the hero is someone else, not you. And then people will listen in. But if it's all you, it's like, well, great. You know, that just doesn't. Your goal is to always bring the audience to you and not to separate yourself. So the choice of the clothes that you wear, the language you use. I mean, I have a great client that just started with us in uh, February. And uh, they're kind of like the wild, wild west. I mean, it's a predominantly male culture and it's, um, it likes swearing. I just know what to say it. So there was a lot of freedom for me when I did a kickoff for them in, uh, uh, in February. And I could use language that I would never use on the other stage. But you know what it, it did? It brought them to me because it said, oh, you know what our culture is like. It's like, I know. So Interesting. Yeah, because you know, I, I certainly never heard anything like that out of your mouth before. Uh, no. <laughs> it's, my, it's probably my one thing you're always afraid of is that you're going to say something like that. I had a speech one time. I did the same speech three times in a row. First, we knocked it out of the park. Then the, that night, this guy – or no, then I did the second day, knocked out of the park. This guy's like, oh, the market director, well, come to dinner with us. So there's four of us in a car. We're driving somewhere, and I – and I, I don't even know what the story was, but somehow I said, uh, yeah, that'd be, and I used the F word, something, and the guy's like, whoa, Bob, dropping the F bomb. I'm like, seriously? Really? Like, we're going to dinner? At a, okay. So I became very afraid. So the next day, I'm in the middle of the speech, get to my same place that I was, and I said, otherwise, you end up like Macy's, except I hear everybody, I hear an audible gasp from the front row, like, <gasps> and I thought, you just said F and Macy's. You just said it. And now I'm sweating and I'm thinking, oh my God, I just said it. I just, oh my God, my worst nightmare. And then I look down and there's a lady probably in her 60s and she goes, yeah, otherwise you do end up just like Macy's. Oh, I, I, I said just like. But how I'd been primed the night before because I was so afraid of it that it's like, oh my God, it came real. And nowadays, I, if that happened, I would probably just say, yeah, sorry about that. Because, <laughs> but yeah, that was, a, that was a real moment 10 years ago. That was a... That was a, a very long 20 seconds. Yes, I can only imagine. Yeah. So we, you, you mentioned about hope for a moment. So I do want 
I, I would love for you to share with us what your Hope for Retail project is and why you created it. So I am pretty big on LinkedIn. I'm a top voice on LinkedIn. I have, I don't know, 400, 440,000, something like that, followers on LinkedIn. And because of that, my feed gets chock-a-block with people writing about retail because I'm the retail doc. So, uh, you know, every, geez, all the way through much of April, you know, here's another retailer that's going to go out. The four brands you most love that are bound to be gone when we get out of this. Uh, no one will be shopping retail. It just went on and on. And I just, and I'd even start putting it on there like, gee, it's sad to see some of my favorite writers who quote me all the time, uh, just giving into this doom and gloom, no hope stories. I'm done with it. And then one day it just hit me like, well, if I want to change the dialogue, why don't I find a way to bring my hope about retail to a new level? So I, I made a list and I said, for the next 30 days, I'm going to come up with one brand or big retailer. I'm going to tell one story about a purchase I've made and I'm going to come up with this hashtag hope for retail. So I started this about two weeks ago. I'm halfway through the project, start off with Macy's. And I just talked about how uh, in the first one, I think I talked about buying my plates from Macy's actually out of my brown couch right there that I got at South Coast Plaza in uh, Los Angeles probably 14 years ago. And I just talked about how when we go to a brick and mortar store, there's a story about, the, about how we discovered that purchase as well as the product. And you have to remember that. And so, so many of the stories that I tell are about me walking into a store and not having an idea I wanted it and then walking out with it or somebody surprising me in a way that met with such great customer service that I had to have it. And uh, it's surprising how it's really kind of taken off. I mean, uh, I think the one we did yesterday, uh, which it posts on Facebook and LinkedIn now. So if you go to the retail doctor for Facebook, you'll find me. Uh, don't be confused. There's another guy in Australia using my brand, but the one in the U S and I think the reach was like 116,000 yesterday. It was like, nice. you're kidding me. So, uh, I feel, and I feel good about it because the whole project is that every brand that I mention, I, I say to each of the employees, like you might be on furlough right now, but when you come back, you better meet us with hope because that's what brought us into your store to begin with. We want to have a feeling that we matter and that people feel they matter, buy more. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I like it, uh, but I gotta tell you, um, I'm glad I gave myself 30 days because uh, I can't imagine doing this for 60 days. You know, you think of a lot of things you have, but then you try to think of, now what was the story behind that? And that's a, <laughs> that can be daunting sometimes. I tell you, I love them though. I watched the, I've watched a few of them. The one that stuck with me, it was either yesterday or day before, I believe it was the piece of artwork that you had purchased. Oh yeah, the metal Prescott. Sculpture. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, what a, what a cool story and, and talk about a, a, a customer experience. Right. And the fact what I loved was that the gallery reached back at, back out to you. I, I don't know what the gap was from the time that you made the purchase to the time that they contacted. It was like almost a year. Yeah. I had first seen it in the gallery that. in Hawaii. I was on vacation and it stuck with me and, uh, but I didn't like, you know, packing it and all that didn't quite seem right. And so when I got back home and then there was a gallery not that far from me, it made it easier to purchase. And then after I got it, they said, Oh, you know, Prescott's going to be at the gallery. And it's like, well, that was eight months ago. Well, bring it in. He'll sign it. So he signed it and it was a great guy. And it was a great experience, but people want to have those experiences, Jay. That's just it. Whatever your brand is, there's a story there that you have to remember. That's what it's about. Like you have the story about meeting me in the speech and you know, all of those toys, those things we played around with the experiences we had, well, that's your story. But just like, my stories with Mike and, and the, and the coffee house. Um, we have to remember that those happen every time somebody chooses your service or buys your product and be very aware that that's what makes your business successful. If you don't have stories, you don't have a successful business. Yeah. Boy, that is a, a powerful truth and something that we all need to remember. So what are some lessons that you've learned during this pandemic? Oh my God. Um, the days of, you know, uh, business as usual are gone forever. I think an awful lot of retailers, we never could have imagined that someone ever in our lifetime would say, close down your stores for two months. That wasn't in our scope of mind. So I think the fragility of how it all works, I think the 
Um, I think it's the things that have it's unleashed is there is a great fire burning in the economy right now, which is people who were already singed are going to be gone. And realistically, that could be 10 to 20% of all businesses. That's not just retail, that's manufacturing, that's uh, services, et cetera, because they weren't doing well to begin with. You know, I have people who join me on my Facebook lives on Sunday mornings at 9 a.m. for the retail doc, just one more plug. And, uh, and they'll tell me about, you know, I only have one employee or I, um, uh, you know, I'm only open 10 to 5 Monday through Friday. And I said, well, you have a hobby. You don't have a business. And they don't really want to hear that. But it's like, if you're serious, you're open when customers who work can actually shop with you. And if it's at your convenience of when you're open, then you're not going to be around. And if you if you think that you can wait on people with just yourself, that means you haven't really cracked the code of coming up with a service or a store or something where there's going to be many people that are going to need to be waited on at a time. And so your business skills need refining or you've just got a hobby and that's okay. You know, if you've got a partner, Sigma and other who is uh, making money, you need a tax deduction. Well, you know what? In the 80s, that was acceptable, but I can guarantee you after COVID-19, that's not going to be acceptable for anybody. Mm. Yeah. So, so true. That's a, yeah, those are tough words to hear, but it, they're necessary words at the same time. And yeah. Blunt, blunt. So l let's, uh, let's get tactical for, for a moment. For those that are listening, what are some key actions that businesses should be taking right now to survive, serve and thrive moving forward? Well, you always have to look at your cash flow. I mean, that's the, you don't want to be caught off guard. So Go to your bank, get your bridge loan. If you haven't applied for PPP, which some unbelievably stupid people in my judgment uh, tell me, oh, I don't want to do that. Then the government owns me. It's like, it's free money. Uh, get your get there like everybody else is. I certainly would, would do it. Um, I would also be looking at, has your shopper fundamentally changed? we're getting an awful lot of surveys, anecdotal surveys. And you know, the one that's hitting us in retail right now is, Oh, customers are forever changed. They're going to be buying online. And then you look down and you say, Oh, who put this out? And then you go and click and click and click. Oh, it's an online fulfillment company. What a surprise. <laughs> and you know, one of the things that I, I'm saying actually in a webinar tomorrow is, um, you know, the Spanish flu wiped out 675 million, 675,000 people in the U.S. alone in 1919. And yet a year later, during the height of prohibition, they're going to speakeasies, which are crammed together and uh, dark and perfect places that the virus could have spread. So this idea that we're always going to be forever changed, I think, can get a, a lot of hyperbole uh, where, you know, someone has something they want to bring to you. That said, you know, customers in your market may have changed. So be really careful about um, saying our customers will always love us because realistically other things may take priority over your services. So make sure that you're out there saying I'm here to serve, not sell. Mm -hmm. um, I reached out to all of my clients a good month, if not longer ago and said, look, this is what's going to happen with your retailers. They're going to end up feeling like X, Y, and Z. Let me put a webinar together. Let's find a way to get through this together. One wrote back so quick. I said, oh, that's great. So you want to have this in a couple of weeks? He's like, mm, I'm thinking like Wednesday. This is Monday. He's like, okay, all right. And uh, his comment to me was, he, he wrote back and said, thanks, you make it look like I'm a god to my members. And I said, great, because that's all that I care about is how do you look good to your customers? So the same thing is going to be with us for a while now. So for all of you is how do we serve, not sell. And again, I get it. You're doing things for charity. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm actually talking about what are you doing for your customers to actually remind them what a great guy you are, how creative you are, all of those kind of things. So that when things do pick up, when you reach back to them, they pick up the call or they reply to the email or they see that you were in a local press magazine or article or something. And all of those impressions have built up this tribe of people who trust you. And at that point, then 
your message gets legs because now they're searching you out. And ultimately, I, I'm a big believer in inbound marketing. I'm, I'm about putting as much content out there as I can that's valuable, that's interesting, that actually is going to affect your business. And then um, that grows the pie so that other people that do that as well can get it. But make no mistake, it's designed that you are going to click just like this this uh, interview today, you're going to click and say, that retail doc guy, who is he? And what's he about? And then they end up being exposed to my world. And if they find it's a fit, then they go, this guy's great. And if they're looking for discounts and coupons, they're like, this guy doesn't believe in our stuff. I don't want to follow him. Great. Well, speaking of being out on social media, on all different platforms, what is the best way for our viewers to connect with you, to learn more about you? And more importantly, how do we engage with your content? And if we want to hire you, how do we do that? Well, you just give me a million dollars and I'll go anywhere, even on a plane right now. But that's probably not as a, a, a big group of your listeners today. Certainly go to retaildoc.com, R-E-T-A-I-L-D-O-C.com. That's short for retail doctor. But you can certainly follow me on LinkedIn. There's 440,000 of you out there, I think. Uh, it's just Bob Fibs. You'll find me there. Or check me out on Facebook, The Retail Doctor. Is and I, and I, I post several things a day, but that's where you'll find my hope for uh, retail, I do one of those live every day, usually between 9 and 9.30 a.m. Eastern time. And then you also see that on LinkedIn and YouTube as well. Uh, but uh, I encourage you to check out my live video on Sunday mornings, 9 a.m. Some people call it Bob's Church, where uh, people ask me questions on Saturday night and I will answer them live on Sunday morning. And uh, it's always varied and it, you don't have to be a retailer. It's just, you know, ask any questions you want. Fantastic. All right. Well, we'll definitely do that. I've got one more question for you before we wrap up. And that is, what are you optimistic about? Oh, I'm optimistic about retail. I mean, quite simply, people forget that the reason we go out shopping is we want to discover what's new. We want to treat ourselves, and we are hopeful when we go out into retail. That's what you have to remember. People are already saying enough. I want to get out there. I want to, I want to be safe, but I want to get out there. And even if some of the merchandise might be two, two months old, it's that promise of I'm going to discover something is the key to what makes retail work. And quite simply, hope is what makes the economy go around. So if you're just tuning in more hope, uh, doom and gloom stories, and you're putting it in your ear, like there's going to be a second and a third wave, and there's going to be this and this. And oh my God, I just read that this and this happened. And you want to be that person that keeps carrying that garbage with you and then spewing it out and letting other people have to deal with it afterwards. I think you're gonna have a tougher time in this recovery. So what I'm hopeful about is people are gonna suddenly learn, oh, I have to manage my thoughts. Because mm. what goes in comes out here. And if I don't want what comes out here to be negative, then I gotta be really careful what I put in here. And, uh, and the more we do that, then I think we end up working on our business instead of shooting our mouths off or trying to find gotcha moments where you didn't wear a mask or you didn't deserve an SBA loan or all that other nonsense. Let's just get back to business and let's get back to realizing that humans are the way forward, not technology. There you go. Powerful words, Bob. And it goes to, tell, goes to show that mindset matters. It matters in every area of life. So thank you for pointing that out. And also, thank you very much for joining us on the Coffee Chat today. I certainly appreciate it. I'm grateful for you. And for all of you, thank you so much for watching. If you found value in this episode, please like and share with your friends. And until next time, stay healthy and optimistic. Keep learning and growing. And remember that transformative change in your life and business begins with you. And nothing happens until you take action. Take care, everybody.